right, students, this is a lecture on categorical statements and the square of opposition. So in the last video, you became a Venn master. And so now we're going to take those skills as a Venn master and apply them to um, Aristotle's famous um, working of logic. So logic is designed to sort of be a way to represent the way we think. So we can't sort of like open up your brain and look and see how it's working. So over the years, different people have attempted to uh, come up with a scheme, a method to demonstrate visually and conceptually what's going on in our minds as we think about things. And so Aristotle, that's why I'm here at the uh, Oracle of Delphi and uh, uh, all the way back to ancient Greece. So this is 2,500 years ago. Aristotle developed these ideas, and we're still using them, which is really astounding. So uh, we're going to go into the categorical statements, and then we're going to look at how they get names, and they get assigned letters, and then what you can do once you know one corner of the square of opposition. So you'll need to master these. You may need to take some good notes, because you're going to need to know this material for the exam in this unit. Okay, so as we uh, discussed in your Venn Master Lecture, categorical statements divide the world into two categories and then make some statement about the relationship between those two categories. And so here we have uh, my little Lego uh, minifig named Sophie that I created, and uh, Sophie there and her dog um, uh, Soren, and they are made out of plastic. And so we have two categories, the category of Sophie and the category of plastic. Those are two categories. And as I go through and I make categorical statements, I can make a show a relationship between those two categories. By the way, this is important. Um, whenever you talk about an individual, it is a category of one. And so you understand that what you're saying is all things just like Sophie, of which there is only one. Um, well, we're not going to get too technical here, but uh, th think about myself. So I say Dr. Shell. Dr. Shell is a category of one. Um, all people who are exactly like Dr. Shell, which is only one, and then you can make a, a connection between those categories. So individuals, basically sort of proper nouns. If I said Paris, there's only one Paris. When I say Paris, you know, you know I mean Paris, France. There is a Paris, Kentucky, but let's not get too carried away. So as we take that statement and we put it into uh, standard forms, what we would call standard logic book form, it looks like this. All Sophies are plastic. Uh, we always use the present tense. Uh, even if you're talking about things in the past, you still, in categorical logic, will put it in the present tense. Um, all Sophies are plastic. Uh, and so I'm saying there's a relationship between the category of Sophies, which is one. It's a category, category of Sophie, and a category of plastic. And I'm saying that all Sophies are plastic. So as we talked about in our Venn Master lecture, um, you would diagram it sort of like this. If we were drawing this out, uh, you would say that there's two categories. There's the category of all Sophies, and there's the category of plastic things. There are lots of things that are plastic, uh, little toy dinosaurs and, and sand buckets and just blobs of plastic. There's lots of things in the plastic category. But in the Sophie category, there's only one and it is in the middle overlap because all Sophies are plastic, right? Or we, before, all Skittles are pleasant. So all the Skittles are in the overlap. There are no Skittles that are not pleasant. There are no Sophies that are not plastic. So this is sort of what it looks like. So Aristotle um, devised that there are four and only four possible categorical propositions, categorical statements. There are only four. Let me say that again. There are only four. And these are exactly what they are. There are no variations. And so you need to master these, be able to recognize them when you see them. 
Uh, and to make it simpler for us as we work with categorical propositions and statements and then move into categorical arguments, um, we assign them letters, A, E, I, O. Um, I didn't do it. It's been around for millennia. So uh, just roll with it. A, E, I, O. And they always do this. A is all S's are P. Now you see why we use Sophie and Plastic or Skittles and Pleasant is I'm trying to maintain because what you do is the first term is called the subject term. The second term is called the predicate term. Don't think about predicate like a verb in English. Uh, it just means one is first, the subject, one is second, it's the predicate. All S's are P. E statement, no S's are P. No Skittles are poisonous. The I statement, some S's are P, some Skittles are purple, right? Uh, some Sophies have dogs, maybe, I don't know. Okay, and O statement, some S's are not P, some Skittles are not purple, some students are not present. Okay, so the O statement, some S's are not. Those are the only four statements that there are on the planet. Um, and so Aristotle's way of looking at it is, the first thing you have to do is take a statement, an argument, break it down into its parts, and then force them into this kind of construction, right? So if I said uh, that Dr. Shell has a dog named Wendell, you would say all S's, all Dr. Shells, are people who have a dog named Wendell. So it, it, it gets a little chunky, when you try to force it into logic book form, that's why we break it down to S's and P's and Q's and R's. It's just much easier to work with. But you start with a, a statement, an argument. You break it down and you simplify it. And um, honestly, sometimes you can take entire paragraphs and assign them one letter, right? So this whole, art, this whole paragraph is an S. And it is in relationship to this other paragraph and it's P and then what is the author trying to do with it so this is a way of sort of simplifying it down into its very basic components okay and so each categorical statement whether it's an A E I or O has parts and you need to make sure you can identify the parts because we're going to be manipulating those parts and just rec and talking about those parts um, each one of those statements, A, E, I, and O, has a quantifier. Okay, it's the all, or the sum, or the no, or the sum are not. It's the part of the statement that tells you what's the relationship. Okay, it, all of them, none of them, son of them. Okay, and then there's a subject class. That's the first part. All Sophies are plastic. The subject is the part that comes first. Okay, uh, all, all terrorists are evil. The terrorist is in the subject position. It's an A statement, and in this case, terrorist is in the uh, subject position. The copula is the linking part. It's the verb. The are or the are not, right, that, that connects the relationship between this part and that part. And then the last part of the statement is the predicate. Okay, it's the plastic part. It's the all Skittles are pleasant. All, uh, all students are present. Okay, so uh, the the second part after the copula is the uh, predicate, and it's going to be really important that you understand that because as we move into categorical arguments, knowing where the predicate is and where the subject is is really important when you break these things down into. Uh, arguments right now where they're just statements okay remember going back to the beginning of the semester first of all you have to know do you have a statement right remember shut the door isn't a statement that's a command uh, what time is it that's not a statement that's a question once you have a statement then you can have three statements and it becomes an argument okay the same thing is true in categorical logic first we have to make sure we understand what the, the statements are the propositions then you build them into arguments and they have three lines and we'll deal with that in another lecture
Okay, I don't really know why I feel compelled to put this slide up there, but it's in all the logic books. So this is what it looks like. If you take the AEIO statements and then you line them up, what are the qualifiers? Some, all, some are, some are not. Okay, what's the subject? It's always the same. The copula, what connects them and what's the predicate? So this is how it breaks down between the AEI and O statements. Okay, and now the fun really starts. This is the place where Aristotle uh, made his bread and butter, right? This is the genius of it, is that he developed this thing which is called the square of opposition. I use what is called the traditional square of opposition, which is the one that Aristotle developed. Um, there have been some advances in logic, and a guy named Bullion has come up with some criticism of Aristotle, and uh, that's great, but I don't care. I like Aristotle. So I'm sticking with Aristotle. If you get into an advanced logic course, uh, you can discuss the difference between the two. But I'm going to use this traditional square of opposition. And what Aristotle basically discovered is that if you know something about any one corner, you then know something about the other corners as well. Now, maybe not all of them, but you can make a direct inference. Once you know something about one corner, you can make inferences about the other statements. And there are particular ways to do it, and we're going to walk ourselves through that. Um, but this is really sort of the power of it, is then you can realize what happens sometimes is people will make one statement, and then they want to pretend like the opposite is also like we're going to say that the opposite is negative, right? Um, so the it's important to recognize that that's not always the true, and we have to make sure you know what the rules are in sort of working your way around this square of opposition. Let's just try it real quick. Okay, so we've decided that all Sophies are plastic. If that's true, okay, then if you go directly across the square diagonal, then the opposite corner is the opposite. If A is true, O is false. So all Sophies are plastic is true. Therefore, some Sophies are not plastic is false. And we're going to work through this and we'll discover that if A is true, that truth flows down and I is true. If it's true that all Sophies are plastic, it is also true that some Sophies are plastic. This is important to get this. Some is part of all. Okay? If you have all the beans, then you also have some of the beans because some is contained inside of all. So flu truth flows down, false flows up. But if it's true, a is true, all Sophies are plastic, then E has to be false. No Sophies are plastic. If A is true, then E has to be false. And so what we've discovered is, if I know one corner, I therefore can know all four corners. Now that's only true if A is true. We're going to work ourselves around this uh, as we go. Another way we can sort of think about this square of opposition is if you draw a line down the center vertically and you divide it into two halves, the left are affirmative and the right are negative, right? All S's RP is affirmative. Some S's RP is affirmative. On the other side, no S's RP is a negation. Some S's are not P is a negation, okay? And you can then also look at it, if you draw a line up and down, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, if you draw a line horizontal, you're now dividing it between the one, the, the statements above the line are universal. All S's are P and no S's are P are both universal statements. The ones below the line are particular some S's are P, some S's are not P. So you could actually divide this into four quadrants. A is universally affirmative. E is universally negative. I is particularly affirmative. And O is particularly negative. Okay, so 
uh, we're going to talk now a little bit about the relationships. If you know something about one corner, and by the way, that knowledge can be either uh, positive, uh, true or false. I can know that A is true or I can know that A is false. Either way, I can run it around the square of opposition. So the first thing we need to understand is the contradictory movements. If you know anything about one corner, then you know the opposite is true of the opposite corner. Okay? If all Sophies are plastic is true, then just go across the line and O, oh, some Sophies are not plastic, has to be false. Okay? So that's the law of contradictory. Okay? The contradictory movement is that when you move diagonal across the square, if you know that that one of them is false if i know a is false okay um, all sophies are made out of pudding okay that's false okay then if you go across the diagonal some sophies are not pudding is true right it's true that some sophies are not pudding because all sophies are not pudding is all sophies are pudding is a false statement Okay, so when we move to the upper part of the universals, this is what we call the sum, the contrary. Okay, so if A is true, then E is false. If E is true, A is false. Okay, so if one, either one of them, if you know A or E are true, then the opposite side at the top will be the the contrary okay if all sophies are plastic is true then go across the top to the contrary and e must be false no sophies are plastic has to be false now this is important please note this on the top a and e in the universals they can both be false but they cannot both be true. If one is true, the other has to be false. But they could both be false. For example, if I told you that all professors at Jefferson have PhDs, okay, all professors at Jefferson have PhDs, and you say, well, that is false. A is false. Okay, it is false that all professors at Jefferson have PhDs. Ah, so you think, well, if A is false, E must be true. No, because E says no S is RP. So then you're saying no professors at Jefferson have a PhD. But some do, including yours truly. So in this case, A is false and E is false. Okay, so the top universals can both be false but they cannot both be true. And that's really important that you, you make that distinction. And this is where a lot of people get messed up on logic. This is one of the places where a lot of people sort of try to um, make political statements or they're trying to sell you something. And they sort of say, well, A isn't true. Therefore, E must be, or you say e, A is false. Then they're going to say, oh, well, then E must be true. No, they could both be false. Okay, and if we move horizontal along the bottom line between the I and the O, we find a similar rule uh, applies that if one is true, ah, this is a different one. Okay, down here, okay, down here, they can both be true, but they can't both be false. Okay, so think of it this way. If I say some students are present, um, if I tell you that that is true, some students are present, it's also possible that some students are not present. Okay, so if we're having a Zoom call or if we're ha in a classroom situation and I say, hey, some students are here, that's true. But it could also be the case that some students are not here okay so they could both be f true 
That's different, right, than the contrary. And the subcontrary, they could both be true, but they can't both be false. Okay? Um, so if I tell you that um, some Skittles are purple, and I tell you that that's true, and then, uh, no, I mean, yeah, if I tell you some Skittles are purple, and that's false, then it can't be the case that some Skittles are not purple is also false. Okay, so they can't both be false. They can both be true, but they can't both be false because they exclude each other, right? That little X in the middle. I mean, if it, it either is or it isn't. Um, some students are present is false, then I guess no students are present. You're like, well, no, that might not be the case either. So this is important that you sort of understand that the movement back and forth in the, in the subcontrary, they can both be true, but they cannot both be false. At the contrary level, it's the opposite. They could both be false, but they cannot both be true. Now, when we move on either side going up and down, uh, truth trickles down, okay? And I always think about it sort of like, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the false rises to the surface. The lies will always come to the surface. So truth flows down and false flows up, okay? So um, if I tell you that all the students are present, then that's true, all the students are present in class today. Then you go down and it's also true that some students are present because some is contained inside of all. All sophies are plastic. Therefore, some sophies are plastic. And the same is true on the other side. If it's true that no Skittles are poisonous, it's true. The truth flows down and some Skittles are not poisonous poisonous is also true because some is contained inside of um, the, well, n some are not is included in the no uh, part of the E statement. Okay, so truth flows down and you guessed it, false flows up. So when we look at the other way of driving this train, if the bottom is false, okay, um, some students are present. If that's false, if it's false that some students are present, then it must also be false that all students are present is false, right? Because if I'm looking at my ro roster and I say, um, gosh, um, some students are present in the classroom today. Oh, that's false. Well, then they all can't be here because you've already told me that some of them are here is false. So false flows up and truth flows down. Okay, so now I want to give you a chance to try a few of these. So what I want you to do here in a second is I want you to, um, I want you to pause this um, video and I want you to decide in each of these cases which argument which statement is it is it an a e i and o and if you need to go ahead and write it down because i want you to work with this so i want you to stop the video decide which each of these uh, statements what kind of statement is it i'm going to pause it right now and then turn it back on once you've written down what you think they are Okay, uh, so here is the answer. Um, some fraternities have dangerous initiations. Notice that some, right? Some fraternities are organizations that have difficult, I mean, dangerous initiations. So you got to kind of play with it to get it in logic book form, but that's an I statement. All cases of plagiarism are forms of cheating. That's a classic all statement. By the way, that's really true. And... Um, uh, I hammer students about this all the time. Uh, man, don't do it. Um, I every semester end up failing um, a couple of students and have seen some students get um, expelled from the college for uh, plagiarizing papers. Man, just don't do it. Okay, E, no traitors are patriots. E, no traitors are 
patriots, okay? And then, O, oh, some dogs are not mammals. Some dogs are not mammals. Some are not. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, well, Dr. Shell, that statement is false. That's, that's just wrong. You're right. It is an incorrect statement, but it is an incorrect O statement. Okay, and we're going to deal with it, okay? But I want you to understand, it's in the right form. That before we can deal with the truth and the, the uh, validity of statements, we first have to decide, is it in the right form? So it's in the right form, it just happens to be wrong. So I want to see, what can you do with this? Once you know that I is true, some fraternities have dangerous initiations. First of all, the contradictory emotion diagonal across the line you know is false. If I is true, some fraternities have dangerous initiations, then it is false that no fraternities have dangerous initiations because we've already established that some are. Therefore, the E statement has to be false. Now, in this case, we know that truth flows down, but false flows up. So, uh, we're stuck at the I. We don't know about A. Okay, We know I is true, but we do not know if A is true. We know that uh, E is false, but remember, A and E can both be false. So we can't automatically come across the contrary. And since E is false, it does not move down. So if we know an I statement is true, the only thing we absolutely know for sure is that E is false. Because uh, in the bottom, I and O can both be true. So the fact that we know one is true, we don't know what about the other. And we can't go up, we can only go diagonal, and that's where we're stuck. So an I statement, why is that? Well, think of it. It's particular. Because if it's particular, you can't make any assumptions about the universals, except for the contrary. All right, good. Okay, so now let's look at this E statement. No traitors are patriots. So uh, we can go back to other forms of deductive reasoning, right? The definition of a traitor and the definition of patriot would suggest that they are mutually exclusive. So that makes sense. No traitors are patriots. But if we know that E is true, we know the diagonal is false, right? Some traitors are patriots is is false. Okay? So if E is true, I is false. Ah, but false flows up. Okay? So now we know that uh, that A is also false. If some traitors are patriots is false, then it's also fa false that all traitors are patriots. Okay, and if we know A, we can go diagonal across to decide that O is true. Some traitors are patriots is, um, I mean, is false, right? So uh, what we work here is that by knowing that E is uh, true, truth flows down. Do we know the contrary on the opposite side? Okay, and false flows up. So we, in this case, we actually know all four corners once we have established an E is true. Okay, so here's an A, right? All cases of plagiarism are forms of cheating. If that is true, then we can go diagonal across the line and we can say that it the diagonal, the con contradictory is false. All, If all plagiarism is cheating, then some plagiarism is not cheating is false. Okay? And if O is false, false flows up. So um, it is false that no cases of plagiarism are cheating. Okay? So if all cases of plagiarism are cheating is true, then the no cases of uh, plagiarism are cheating has to be false. 
and then truth flows down. So if A is true, I is true as well. So notice that. Now, see, you might have noticed there's a pattern here. If you know that the universals are true, then you know all four corners. If they're false, you not you don't have quite as much information. And the same is true of the particulars. If a particular is true, you don't have far to you, there's not much you can do. If the particulars are false, you've got a little more uh, traction. All right, let's pause that. Okay, now we come to this weird one. Um, some dogs are not mammals. Now we know that is false. Okay, that's fine. Because the square of opposition doesn't require that the statements be true. It's just a matter of saying, if you know something about one corner, what else can you establish? So, if O is false, some dogs are not mammals, is false. Go diagonal across the contradictory, and now we can establish that all dogs are mammals. Well... If all dogs are mammals, the top universals cannot both be true. So if A is true, then guess what? E is false. And truth flows down. So if A is true, I is true. So, bada boom, bada bing, we know all four corners if a particular is false. Okay, so um, that's basically how you work this. And so in an exam situation, what you're going to do is you're going to take uh, that statement, and you're going to have to decide, um, hmm, is that, a, is that a fair assertion? Okay? Um, so, you know, if, if somebody's trying to sell you a used car, and they say, you know, some of these Camrys will go for 300,000 miles, okay? So, he's trying to lead you to an inference that if some Camrys go 300,000 miles, then perhaps all Camrys go 300,000 miles and you should buy his, okay? But that's an invalid move and you should catch it, right? He cannot move from a particular to a universal going up, okay? Some do, that's true, but that doesn't guarantee that all do because truth flows down, false flows up okay on the other hand if you said that um you know um oh well who knows you got it okay i don't want to beat this dead horse so uh you want to make sure that you sort of understand this i these are what you're going to see on an exam you're going to be sit, given a statement and then you're going to be given sort of an inference and want to know can i make that inference when you're looking for your categorical um, arguments in the wild you're going to be looking for examples where somebody tries to use a statement and lead you to a conclusion. And we're going to want to know, can you make that jump? Okay, so that's what you're looking for. Take good notes as you um, work through these lectures. And if you're not sure, you got it nailed down, please come to the online office hours so that we can uh, work it through to make sure you really mastered it before you move on to the other assignments and to the exam. Thank you.